Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth Cotton Masterclass. This is the fourth of six masterclasses that are taking place throughout October. These are facilitated by Willis Towers Watson's Climate and Resilience Hub, uh, supported by Forum for the Future and funded by the Loudest Foundation. I'm Charlene Collison from Forum for the Future, and uh, I'm your host for today. You'll notice uh, that on joining this masterclass, uh, you've been muted, but we encourage you to put any questions you want to ask throughout the sessions um, uh, in the Q&A. So you can activate the Q&A panel, uh, you can by clicking the three dots in the bottom right of your screen and select Q&A and put your question in there. The session will be recorded um, and uh, we hope and encourage you to watch this masterclass through a desktop device. Um, you may have some technical issues if you're looking at it through a mobile phone. So to kick off uh, this session, we know that the, the, the entire cotton value chain is um, extremely vulnerable to climate risks and um, increasingly so uh, as the impacts of, of climate um, become harder. And to thrive in a world characterized by climate disruption, the cotton sector, in fact, every uh, agricultural sector um, needs fairly radical change. And this needs sector wide collaborative action. And this is the work that Cotton 2040 has been doing over the past seven years, um, bringing together stakeholders from across the cotton sector to, uh, to understand and address issues that are critical for Cotton's future, and this has been supported by the, uh, the funding of the Lattice Foundation. Throughout October, uh, we're holding a series of six masterclasses. These are cutting edge uh, themes uh, related to climate tailored for the cotton industry. And our aim is to help uh, all our listeners to build a better understanding um, of adaptation, of climate adaptation for cotton and to embed climate adaptation into their strategies of targets. So welcome to today's master's class on governance and people. I'm really lucky to be joined today by three instrumental leaders within Willis Towers Watson's Climate and Resilience Hub. Um, firstly, we have Hannah Summers. Hannah is an associate director in Willis Towers Watson's executive compensation and, and board advisory team. Han is particularly focused on helping drive climate goals uh, through executive incentive schemes and uh, as well as board level engagement on climate and broader ESG issues. We're also joined by Kate Stein. Kate is a senior associate in Willis Towers Watson's Climate and Resilience Hub. She helps to organize, uh, she helps organizations to work with external stakeholders and to identify and respond to climate risks. And lastly, uh, we're lucky to have with us Ashish Mondal, who is the founder director of ASA. That's the acronym for Action for Social Advancement. Uh, Ashish's uh, major work experience has spanned three decades, um, and that includes working uh, for the development of livelihoods for smallholders through natural resource management, um, through uh, sustainable agriculture and the promotion of smallholder organizations for agribusiness. So, Hannah, Kate, and Ashish, uh, welcome. And I'm going to, uh, to hand over to Ashish to kick us off. Ashish, over to you. So, um, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, just uh, to introduce myself, um, as uh, you have done already. Uh, I would talk a little bit about our work uh, in India. Uh, we work in uh, central India. There are about eight provinces where we work and work mainly on three issues. Uh, uh, firstly, for the natural resources development. Secondly, for the sustainable agriculture. And third is then organizing producers uh, for market linkage. So we have been doing it for the last uh, 28 years uh, now. and. Uh, uh, we have a strong team of over 600 professionals working in the organizations. Um, <clears throat> while uh, our uh, in our work, most of 
the beneficiaries or the, the target group that we work with are, are smallholders. Um, as you know, that India is full of smallholders. In fact, the entire world is full of smallholders. 86% uh, of Indian farmers are smallholders. Uh, they, they possess about one to two acre of land. And uh, agriculture is their main livelihood source. Uh, and they, they supplement it with, with casual wedge employment uh, remittances, uh, uh, that come from the from the members uh, who are working in the cities as either casual laborers uh, that kind of that kind of work. Uh, our work has been largely with the indigenous people um, that is in the central India, which is largely semi-arid. Uh, the rainfall is uh, quite erratic, and uh, the drought proofing etc. is a kind of a <clears throat> major uh, kind of work that we need to do to stabilize production system. Uh, of the many crops, cotton is one of the major crops that they grow. Uh, the problems of the smallholders are multiple. Their major issue is that how do you stabilize their, how do they stabilize their production system because of the various natural uh, factors which are beyond their control are mostly, you know, aggravated due to the climatic conditions uh, that is changing uh, very frequently. The conditions of the farmers on the ground is is quite unstable. So agriculture is not a very stable thing for them uh, to to uh, live uh, quite decently. Uh, with our work, uh, especially with various uh, commodities, especially for the for the cotton that I I would like to talk uh, about uh, here that. When we saw that, you know, since 2014, we have been we have been training farmers for adopting the organic practices. Now, regenerative uh, practice, agriculture practices. We what we saw that there is a there is a uh, there is a willingness uh, on the part of the farmers to adopt such practices because it's it of course helpful for them. Uh, whereas there is uh, there is a constant uh, you know demand uh, from the market side, uh, and there are many brands, uh, retailers. Uh, they are coming forward. They are making uh, big commitments um, uh, in terms of their you know the carbon neut neutrality goal, in terms of their SDG goal, uh, their ESG reporting. All of them are are uh, coming uh, forward, and they're very very encouraging. This definitely kind of, you know, gives us some kind of hope that um, along with the producers and, and the brands, they're probably coming closer and, and there, is a, there is a intent to, to, to do things better for the, for the climate as well as for the farmers and all, all stakeholders. But what is not clear about in this entire process is that, you know, how these big things are going to happen how are we going to ensure that the brands, uh, they get their value, the farmers, the smallholders, they get their value, how this uh, stabilization of production system going to happen, how carbon neutrality aim is going to be achieved. These are some of the things which are unclear at the moment. As a result of it, as a being a producer, I mean, I work with the producer, so I represent them. So I, 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 as, a, as a representative of the producers, if I have to draw a plan for five years, I really don't know whether, whether, whether I'd be able to do that because I don't have the clarity. Sometimes I, I, I find that, you know, there is so much of opportunistic kind of things going on. Sometimes I see that there is a every now and then a new level is uh, popping up, like you know uh, that is a new claim, new level, and there is a you know there is a new way of doing things or probably claiming things. So these are some of the issues which we face at the ground, which makes us little skeptical sometimes about the overall uh, directions in which it is going to take. At well, I mean, I'm optimistic. I, I, I would also like to say at the end of the day that, you know, there is something definitely better than what it was 10 years ago. But as a, as a, as a practitioner, I would like to uh, tell the audience, ki, let us have a better dialogue. Uh, let, us, let, us, uh, let us see that there is a, a better communication across the supply chain and there is a, there is a better coordination uh, among the supply chain actors for for achieving that uh, that you know that final goal that we are trying to achieve, uh, that's what probably would be my opening remark. And I would like to you know um, hear uh, uh, you know in the in the, in the subsequent uh, uh, more more such uh, discussions. And and if there is any question, I would be happy to to respond to that. Thank you.
Thanks, Ajit. That's really fascinating and, and helpful to kick off a section, session with your kind of on the ground perspective um, from working with producers and, and farmers and the, the business value that can be gained from brands and retailers engaging, engaging with them. So I think that that leads nicely into why we're focusing on, on people and governance today. Next slide, please. So we firmly believe that resilience to climate change comes not only from hardening your facilities, but also taking steps to support those people and communities across your value chain, including those that might be particularly vulnerable to climate risks. And, and as Charlene noted earlier, that as, as climate risks intensify, the systemic disruptions that they will cause will increase at scale, which will have material impacts on your value chain. So this kind of whole of whole of value chain approach to resilience starts with people within your organization, particularly your board, your senior leadership and HR professionals, the culture, the processes, the systems, the governance mechanisms that sh should, should all be in place to ensure that perspectives across your value chain are taken into consideration in those kind of operational and strategic decision making um, and, and strategy setting conversations. So in this masterclass, we're going to focus on how physical climate risks interact and intersect with people and communities, the material implications of that for businesses and how employees and leadership can start identifying these risks and respond effectively in a way that engages both people internally and externally. So to kick off the session, we're going to launch a quick poll. Um, results of all of these will be anonymous um, and just, just as to gauge um, your general level of understanding of how climate affects people across your value chain. So if we could, I think, get started. Yeah, great. Just leave it open for 10 more seconds or so. So I think that mainly the kind of purpose of today's sessions, I'm, I'm not expecting everyone to say strongly agree to this. Um, so yeah, the purpose of this session will really to help you feel better equipped um, and have some some tangible next steps. So I'll now pass to, to Kate to frame the session um, by walking through a brief framework for understanding how climate risks affect uh, people across your organizations and your value chain. And then we'll um, kind of switch the focus to um, building an effective response. Next slide and over to you, Kate. Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Great. Thanks, Hannah. Um, so the framework that we're going to walk through today breaks down people into three categories, the grassroots, the grass stems and the grass tops. Um, these categories are obviously generalizations and some nuances lost, but we found they work as a rough and ready way of understanding people and climate risk, both within businesses and across society more broadly. And you'll see the importance of that as we continue on through this presentation. Um, and on the screen, of course, you can see a brief description of which people might fall into each category. So the grass tops are your executives and board members in your business and within society, they tend to be people who um, kind of operate in as critical decision makers and influencers. They tend to have the most authority. They also have the ability to empower people at the grassroots and grass stems level to participate in decision making. The grass stems people in the middle are the middle managers in your business and maybe in society as well. Um, so for the purposes of this framework, that would be people um, like nurses, teachers, essential workers, also corporate employees who are maybe a bit more junior. And then at the grassroots, there are um, frontline and essential workers, delivery drivers, cleaners in your building, farmers and producers like the ones Ashi spoke about. Um, they tend to be more highly exposed to climate risks. Um, and in some cases, that is because of the work that they do, which is maybe is outdoors, like the producers and farmers, um, or because they live on lower incomes. And then just to note across all of these categories, underlying vulnerabilities, such as vulnerabilities related to disability, age, maybe gender or race, these all can intensify the risks from climate change. Next slide, please. So here's everything I just talked through, except now on a chart. Um, in the column on the left, you can see the categorization of grass roots, grass stems, and grass tops. In the row across the top, you have the people, the way people relate to your organization. So if they're directly employed by it, they're internal. In the center, are people who are your primary stakeholders, people who are not employed by your organization, but who still directly influence its operations. And then on the right 
external people are your critical secondary stakeholders. Their well-being depends on the decisions you make relating to people and the planet, but equally many of them, especially frontline essential workers, um, maybe your electricians, your utility workers, trash collectors, these these groups of people support the well-being of the society that your employees and your organization exist in. Um, so I'll give everyone just a second here to take in this chart before we move on. Um, and I will continue to stress too that this is a very rough and ready model with some generalizations and assumptions built into it. Next slide, please. So this is the same chart, but just with a different title. Um, I've already alluded to how your organization, your employees and society more broadly rely on people at the external grassroots level. So that orange column. Frontline workers, essential workers, the pandemic made it clear that we really depend on people in these frontline roles, um, teachers, nurses, bus drivers, utility workers, etc. Let's look at the grass people, grassroots people within your organization, though, now, and the, the people as primary stakeholders in your value chain. We're going to do a brief thought experiment to understand a little bit more about how essential they are to your business, to your risk management, and to your business value. So let's imagine that all the people in a given area of this chart were to just disappear. It's a planned disappearance. Let's say your organization has a year in advance to plan its response to the disappearance of people internally and your primary stakeholders at the grassroots level, both at the grassroots level. So starting from the upper left-hand corner, um, let's think through first what it looks like if people who are sort of your primary decision makers in your organization were just to disappear. The upper left hand corner, that executive level, that's where most of your organization's decision making power lies, where robust governance structures need to be in place to ensure that decision making ensures the well being of people and your organization across the value chain. If your CEO were to disappear and it's planned, obviously that would be a big deal. There would be a drop in market value where you while well, you regain stability with a new CEO, but with the organization and the organization probably wouldn't function exactly the same way. But would it cease to function? No. Now, looking farther down in that column, what if all of your hourly employees disappeared? If there weren't any sales clerks in your organization, your stores are closed. Well, then there wouldn't be anyone there to sell to your customers. Looking across at primary stakeholders, if your logistics workers disappeared, your goods won't reach consumers. How quickly can you train a middle manager to become a longshoreman? Uh, if not that quickly is your answer, then you might be out of luck. And then if your producers or farmers disappeared, the people that Ashis works directly with, there wouldn't even be any raw materials, no cotton for you to make your project, your products. The rest of your value chain would collapse. The key message here is that your business relies on the grassroots and the grassroots the people on the front lines of climate change tend to be most exposed, obviously, to climate risks, both, as I said before, because of the work that they do and because often what they're paid to do that work. One other point on this chart um, in your organization, as I alluded to, the people who have the most decision making power are probably up in that top left hand corner. Of course, they're essential, but the people at the grassroots level, as we've established now, are essential too. And they're often underrepresented in decision making. If there were no former growing cotton, would your CEO have a job? Probably. Would you? Probably but probably not in the cotton apparel business. And that's the key message here. Your organization's well-being depends on people who are not well represented, who are likely not well represented in your organizational decision-making. And these people also tend to be most vulnerable to climate risks. And if we come back to that grass metaphor, the well-being of the grass tops and of the entire blade of grass of your entire organization comes back to the grassroots, people who are often not seen. Next slide, please. So I'll hand it back to Hannah here then to talk a little bit about the challenges and what we're facing. Thanks, Kate. Yes, I think that kind of really um, helpfully highlights the challenge of, the, of the, the broad kind of stakeholder environment and navigating that. So before we, we flip to looking at how to build an effective response, we'd like to hear from you again on what you think some of the, the key barriers are um, for you kind of getting getting the perspectives of, of people uh, along your entire value chain. So if we could pull that um, that poll up now. So it says the most significant challenges for engaging employees and stakeholders in our value chains on issues of people related climate risks are, and then if you could select three. 
I'll give you a bit more time for this one. It's a bit more to read. And then there's a, a second question there as well around just thinking about conscious lots of you will be doing lots of great work already. So what steps are you already considering or taking or likely to consider in the future um, to help really catalyze your um, climate strategy? And these are different examples around engaging with internal people and external people. So I think we need to, sorry, Hannah, to interrupt, but I think we need to close this first poll um, and see the results and then move on to that second question. So we'll give it a minute. These, the polling system takes a minute to close and process the results and then we'll go on to the next one. Um, and Hannah, I don't know if you want to share any brief reflections as the results come in just on sort of um, the challenges that we've seen from clients um, when it comes to sort of engagement and sort of driving that from the grassroots, or sorry, um, excuse me, from the HR function. Um, I think that that's something that you and I have talked quite a bit about, like sort of how it all sort of starts with building understanding that first choice there. Yeah, exactly. So I think in general, in general, it's a um, a challenge around kind of mapping the the stakeholders across your business. Who are they having visibility and access to them? Um, and then also a, a challenge I hear a lot about is kind of who's driving who's driving the agenda. Who's accountable for it? What are the governance mechanisms in place that um, that will um, that that make people and roles in particular kind of take take accountability for? It? And it all comes down to having kind of a person that's particularly passionate about it and driving Climate champion. Yeah, exactly. So if we could close that poll now, I think they might have gone together. But let's see. So yeah, a bit of a, a mix across the challenges. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's, that's and that lack of understanding coming up coming up tops, which is definitely in line with with what we're hearing in our conversations. Okay, so we're going to now we've kind of explored the the business value of integrating both those internal and external perspectives into the climate strategy. We're going to look at some tangible ways of doing this. Um, next slide, please. So we're going to talk through four broad categories for taking action um, in the form of what we'll refer to as a diamond, this diamond model. Um, this has really been informed by our conversations with the clients and also a um, HR and climate survey that we ran last year of over 120 um, companies. Um, and this is really about the most popular and effective ways to engage people on the climate strategy. So we believe that to get the right people in the right place, right time doing the right things means you need to inspire, engage, incentivize and build capacity. And we'll delve into each of these now in turn, um, looking at both the internal and external people perspectives. So if we can move on, please. So firstly, inspire. This is all about building the right culture that's needed to drive behaviours and decisions um, that are needed to meet the climate challenge. And building culture is, is impacted by a whole host of factors. So critically, the role and behavior of, of leaders and, and climate role, role models, your company values, your employer brand, your employee value proposition. And that is what behaviors do we want to see and need to see from people and what will you offer in return? And critically, um, the governance and accountability and oversight mechanisms that guide decision making um, and risk management for the climate strategy, which should include those um, internal operational and people implications, as well as those external supply chain, customer and community implications as well. And, and culture is, as I kind of mentioned before, it's, it's set from the top and grows from within. So you need to inspire your own employees and connect them to the climate strategy in a way that they feel equipped and powered to, to help um, you meet you meet the, the climate um, the climate challenge and drive the strategy. But there's also a, a point here um, around a, a critical point around kind of leveraging that that culture um, and using those tools externally as well, which I think Kate you're going to touch on briefly. Yeah, I mean, I think the key here is that when you're embedding climate resilience into your culture, you make dialogue with your external stakeholders a central feature of that. So when you go through the steps that Hannah's just laid out as far as identifying key stakeholders, building climate into your brand, um, establishing communications, you need to make sure the culture that you're seeing 
that you're creating um, also sees the value of understanding external climate risks and their material implications for your business. Um, so when you're identifying key stakeholders, identify your key external stakeholders along with your internal ones. Keep open channels of communication, two-way channels, dialogue going with them. Um, obviously, to get to this point requires education and awareness building. So congratulations to all of you for joining us today, because this is a critical first step, um, particularly at a board and senior management level, going back to those key decision makers that I talked about before. You need to raise your internal people's awareness that there's business value and climate risk management value in engaging with people external to your company. But I will also say. Successfully engaging with your external stakeholders for all of these reasons, it often doesn't require overhauling your entire culture or your way of doing business. It often actually aligns really well with some of the work you might already be doing on CSR, ESG, maybe corporate philanthropy. Um, done correctly, social engagement on climate has real business value. And I think too often we kind of pigeonhole it just as philanthropy, but external engagement has so much more to offer us um, in the context of the climate challenge specifically, and then I think more broadly as well. Um, so let's go ahead to the next slide and I'll hand it back to you, Hannah. Thanks, Kate. So this is engage, and this is a engagement as a key enabler of culture, and it's also a component of what will be expected from from companies in their in their climate transition plan disclosures um, coming up. So if we look internally, it's so critical to listen to your employees and connect them to the strategy in a way that makes them understand how it relates to their job and how they can influence it listen to them, what do they want to see you doing more or less of, and use those kind of regular and meaningful communications to show them what you stand for and get credit for that as well. Um, and again, the focus of the internal people engagement piece should be about raising awareness around the climate strategy relating to and the impact on um, external stakeholders. And again, those means of engagement can be rolled out to, to external stakeholders as well to integrate the um, external perspectives. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, on the slide, you can see some of the things that you might be doing internally that it's easy enough to extend to your external stakeholders. I think the key point here is that these need to be ongoing opportunities. Risks evolve, so it's not enough to just do a one off town hall or survey. Um, obviously great for you for doing that, but really it needs to be an ongoing dialogue and key to that, I think, is having um, people at the senior level dedicated to external stakeholder engagement. So, for example, maybe a senior vice president who's a director of community accountability or even um, board roles for external stakeholders, external stakeholder audit committee committees. Um, and then there are a number of collaborative initiatives developing kind of in on a lot of different issues, but I think on cotton in particular, um, that bring together external stakeholders from across the industry. Um, and so participating in those is a great opportunity um, to get sort of a grass tops level of engagement with external perspectives. But I think the a key message here is that it needs to be external engagement at all levels, grass tops, but all the way down to the grassroots as well. Next slide. So then we've got incentivize, and, and this is kind of once you've defined and socialized your strategy or transition plan, the underlying metrics and targets of the transition, and you've identified the behaviors you want to incentivize, you should really also review your reward programs to make sure that they are incentivizing and rewarding people towards those behaviors and goals. Um, executive compensation arrangements should serve to drive management towards strategic KPIs. So as climate is now forming a key pillar of most organizations' strategies, um, it also makes sense for it to be um, forming part of their remuneration as well. Um, and the merits of doing this are, are well established. Investors consider it as a very powerful and tangible governance mechanism to drive the climate strategy um, and see that management are really standing behind it. And internally, it is a really powerful way of setting the tone from the top. So when employees kind of look up, they can see that management are putting their money where their mouth is, so to speak, um, and sending a really clear signal of what's important to the business. But then there are also broader employee incentive and benefits and HR policies that, that should be reviewed as well to, to make sure you're incentivizing the entire workforce, but also and really kind of embedding the, the culture um, within the organization further. And I think 
when we're thinking about embedding climate KPIs, a key part of this is to, going back to sort of the culture piece as well, is to make sure that inherent in your climate strategy, inherent in your climate KPIs are links to external engagement. So thinking about quantitatively the number of opportunities that your organization has taken um, to engage with external stakeholders across your value chain on climate issues. Qualitatively, the types of organ information your organization is hoping to learn um, and you know, how it's used in business decision making. All of those can be tied into your climate strategy and then into your executive compensation structure. And then also um, at the grass stems and grassroots level in your organization, you can include these kinds of um, considerations in employee performance, performance management objectives as well. So for instance, my annual objectives in the Climate and Resilience Hub include an objective specifically around collecting um, the business cases of the business value in external engagement and my bonus is tied to this. So I am highly incentivized to be thinking about how external stakeholders perspectives are important um, in thinking about climate considerations for our part of the business. Next slide. So the final kind of quadrant of the of the diamond is around building um, capability and capacity. So, as with the other areas of the diamond that we've gone through, um, it starts with mobilising people internally. It's, it's critical, firstly, to establish those clear lines of accountability for your climate actions, defining the roles and responsibilities internally, um, and also to do, do a bit of a kind of skills audit. What, what skills and knowledge um, do we need or, or will we need in the future for the organisation to be able to deliver the, the climate transition plan, um, which will clearly vary for different types of roles and then take action to fill those skill gaps through training targeted kind of investment and training etc um which is should absolutely include the board level so board level capability is is absolutely key to ensure that the, the strategy can be governed effectively um and that it, those external perspectives are being included in to decision making and, and risk management as well yeah, absolutely. I mean, Hannah said a lot about sort of awareness, bit of building and the upskilling and sort of the incentives behind that. I think obviously it's important that your external engagement with your stakeholders as you try to help them manage their climate risks um, for the benefit of everyone across the value chain. Um, there, are, there are opportunities for upskilling and cross-skilling there, but oftentimes people on the ground, the grassroots level, the producers and farmers, for instance, they already know what they need. And it's not just a question of sort of talking with them and identifying, um, you know, further educational opportunities that you could support them in, but there are clear needs for financial investment as well. Um, so a few instances where um, corporates or brands and retailers in the cotton industry might be able to support the climate resilience across the value chain through financial investment, through your corporate philanthropy or maybe for a longer term climate strategy um, it would be around supporting the work of NGOs that build capability across your value chains, so the work like Ashish and um, his, his peers in India that they do to support farmers in building their climate resilience. Um, as you create your social investment strategy, make sure it's responsive to community needs and informed by community voices on climate issues and the specific types of challenges that your community faces when it comes to climate change. Um, and then finally, there are opportunities around insurance um, and finance solutions. For instance, co-financing parametric insurance for smallholder farmers. And if that sounds like Greek to you, don't worry, we have a masterclass on it next week. Um, so that will be on next Tuesday. You can learn all about insurance as a way of building resilience across value chains, both sort of at the corporate level, but then also all the way um, at the grassroots, the smallholder holder farmers level. Um, so Hannah, I think next slide, and we'll hand it back to you to close us out here. Great. Well, yeah, thank you. Um, so I guess just to just to wrap up, we've we've spoken, we've talked through the, the challenging stakeholder environment that you have to navigate, um, but then looked through looked through the lens of the diamond model to provide some tips um, on how to start creating response that delivers value for both external stakeholders and also your value chain. Um, we've talked about the importance of integrating perspectives of external stakeholders, especially at that grassroots level, to, which is essential to getting the full picture of the, um, the climate risks that your, that your company face um, and informing your response and engaging internal people as well, because they're the ones that create the culture, who drive the engagement internally and externally, and who create the capacity and capability internally and externally. 
um, to help you respond to, to climate risks. So we've chucked a lot of information at you um, and I'm keen to get to Q&A, um, but if you are feeling a little bit overwhelmed about where to start, then of course reach out. Um, but our recommended first step is to undertake a, a current state audit and really get your hands around the work that will all be already being done across the business, because um, there will be lots being done. Um, and secondly, board level engagement. Buy-in at this level is critical, is crit critical key to kind of unlock um, your company being able to fully address the systemic climate risks um, across the, the entire value chain. So I think let's pause there um, and, and ask Kate if you've got anything to, to add, um, and then we'll, we'll take, go to Q&A. Um, no, let's hand it to Charlene to get us into the Q&A. All right. Thank you, Kate, Hannah, Ashish, for those uh, insights and reflections and a wealth of resources on how to engage and support people um, across the workforce and the value chain. We, uh, we are going to move to the Q&A very shortly. Um, I see we have some questions already. If you haven't posed a question, please do enter it into the Q&A box now, and we will address it as far as we can within our time. Um, before we do that, I just want to emphasize that you can find out more information about climate risks to cotton on the Willis Towers Watson's website. And uh, I, I do encourage you to go there and have a look. Um, there are lots of resources there, including the interactive map, um, showing uh, cotton risks across uh, the globe, as well as a deep dive into India, um, and as well as other reports and, and, and resources. And if you want to learn more about Cotton 2040, the initiative to address some of these critical issues for the future, then please contact Anna Kaneen from For, for the Future. Uh, so let's, let's go into the Q&A. And I'm going to start <clears throat> with a question to you, Ashish. Uh, Ashish, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that when farmers experienced physical climate hazards like droughts and flooding, um, that had an effect on organizations higher up the value chain. Can you tell us a bit more about um, what this looks like and give us an example of this link? Well, I mean, I think, um, you know, I mean, if you talk about the cotton, I mean, the raw materials is basically cotton and most of these uh, textile industries, I mean, they still depend quite a large on cotton as their raw material. I mean, if the farmer suffers, the companies will also suffer. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And and <clears throat> this we we see uh, quite often, like, you know, last year there were crop failures in some parts of the world and that had an impact on other parts of the world. The cotton price soared up and, and uh, you know it was it was a little chaos in the market so these are going to have uh, going to happen quite often so question is therefore that how do i secure my raw material which is coming sustainably my sustainable sourcing and are we therefore taking care of the source sustainability in a way is part of my business so far all businesses related with agribusiness or agriculture as a raw material has enjoyed the benefits of you know getting raw materials uh, which is developed through the philanthropic donations government interventions farmers own investment etc today there is a great need that it becomes also a part of the businesses of the of the of the uh, this uh, you know brands and and, and all the, the incorporations and there is a little bit of money kept aside for the production system development. That's that's my response. Thank to you, it. thank you, Ashish. Um, I'm going to move on to Hannah because I see we have a question um, about uh, your mention of disclosure expectations for climate transition plans, um, which include engagement efforts. Uh, so there's a question about whether you can elaborate on that a bit. Yeah, of course. Good, good question. Um, so yeah, climate climate disclosure requirements are um, heightening globally, um, and then the UK this year has kind of become the first company um, country to mandate climate disclosures effective this year through the TCFD. 
Um, but there are lots of other net zero bodies such as GFANS and then the UK Transition Plan Task Force and ISSB that are um, increasing those um, disclosure expectations and will build on the disclosure pillars set out by the TCFD, which are governance, strategy, risk management and targets. Um, and they will seek to provide kind of further granularity and specificity. But what we can expect is a general kind of raising of the bar of this disclosure expectations, which includes your strat in the strategy section around asking companies to consider interdependencies of their transition plan um, with regard to communities, their social impact and the just, just transition. Um, and also asking companies to describe how they are um, their engagement strategy, so how they are engaging with wider stakeholders, industry um, and their value chain um, as well. So that um, that's definitely got kind of relevant for this, for this session um, and, and in the governance section as well, there's kind of there will be more around asking companies to, to think about how they're embedding their climate strategy through culture, um, engagement, board accountability oversight, et cetera, and skills. Thank you. So, Kate, let's let's move to you. There's a question that's come into the chat um, from a person who writes, my organization sometimes engages with external stakeholders for our CSR efforts, but um, it's looked at as philanthropy or, or doing the right thing, not as something that has material value for our business. Um, I think many of us might find that familiar. How do I help my senior leadership, this person writes, how do I help my senior leadership see the business value in engaging with external stakeholders? Um, thank you to whoever posed that question, because I think that's one that a lot of us share. Yeah, I think that's a really good question and it's not an easy one. Um, as I said before, I think they're kind of the, the, Education is the first key component of this. So again, thank you to all of you for attending today, because hopefully this has given you some insights and maybe some examples that you can take to your senior leadership when you're trying to start these kinds of conversations with them. Um, and Hannah and I and Ashis as well, I think are all available as resources. If you're finding yourself struggling and having these kinds of conversations, please reach out to us because it's something we're all uh, working very hard on over here. I think to um, beyond just the sort of, you know, the trainings and education that like the one that you experienced today, just even starting to have some of these conversations with your external stakeholders, um, particularly at the grassroots level, can help you see the business value. There are a lot of people who work, you know, higher up in the value chain who um, at the brands and retailers of the world, they maybe haven't had that much direct experience with people on the front lines, having conversations with them, um, even, you know, in this age of video conferencing, it's easy enough to reach out and have a conversation. So that would really be another starting point that I'd recommend exploring. If you know sort of who's in your supply chain, in your value chain at different points, then it's, I think it's really important to reach out to them and sort of ask them about what their needs are, what their priorities are, um, and the challenges are that they're facing. And then, you know, make it into a dialogue where you're back and forth with them and providing yourself and as a resource and saying, you know, we really want to be, we want to understand what's happening in your world so that we can support you for the betterment of all of us. Thank you, Kate. And, uh, and I see we've, we've got more questions in the chat that we, then we have time to answer. Um, <clears throat> what we will try to do is, um, put, uh, a summary of today's, uh, presentations and any any answers to the chat um, that we'll we'll uh, send you uh, a quick summary um, of the points of today's session. So I'm sorry if we couldn't get to your particular question. And um, we are now at time and I'd like to just say thank you to everybody who tuned in today. Thank you to our speakers, Kate, Hannah and Ashish. Um, if you would complete the post session survey that will help us continue to improve these sessions. We have two more, and uh, it also gives you access to our session survey. So please um, follow the link that's in the chat now, and that will take you to, uh, to the survey form. We're now going to close. Please join us for the fifth and then the final six Cotton Masterclass sessions coming up. Um, we look forward to seeing you then. All the best for now. Thank you. Thank you.